Today is 6-2 and we're going to talk about properties of parallelograms. What do people in a parallel universe call candygrams? Parallelograms! Uh, no, I'm just kidding. They actually call them candygrams just like we do. So what is a parallelogram? A parallelogram is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. Now you probably already knew that, but this is just a, a reminder. So if we had, let's say, a four-sided shape, we can call this four-sided shape A, B, C, D. Uh, so we have a quadrilateral, and how do we know if this is a parallelogram? Well, it needs two pairs of parallel sides. So perhaps AB is parallel to DC, and AD is parallel to BC. Therefore, we would say that ABCD is a parallelogram. But do we need to write that out every single time on paper? Uh, luckily, no. What we can abbreviate this as is if we were writing this on paper, we can refer to it as you draw a small parallelogram, and we write A, B, C, D. And that's in the order of the letters that we see them, A to B, C, D. And so we could uh, abbreviate this when referring to it as that. Now we're going to talk about uh, some theorems dealing with the properties of parallelograms. We have four theorems, and our first one, 6-2-1, says that a parallelogram has congruent opposite sides. So we're going to look at the parallelogram from the previous slide, A, B, C, D, and we're going to explore exactly what this theorem says. Let's choose a side, A, B. Now, what this theorem tells us is that A, B will be congruent to the opposite side. So we go from A, B, and it's directly across, the one that does not touch A, B. And so AB is congruent to segment DC. And for the same reason, we can say that AD is congruent to segment BC. And that's all the first theorem is telling us. Our next theorem, theorem 6-2-2, says that a parallelogram has congruent opposite angles. Now notice this theorem is very similar to our first one, except the word angles is substituted for the word um, sides. So let's talk about a random angle. Let's say angle B. What this theorem says is that we can talk about angle B and it is congruent to its opposite angle. So if we go from B and go directly across, furthest away from B, it means that angle D is congruent to angle B. And for that same reason, we can say that angle A is congruent to angle C. And this is exactly what theorem 6-2-2 tells us. And our third theorem says that a parallelogram has supplementary consecutive angles. So again, let's talk about that angle B again. But we're going to talk about the measurement of angle B now. Now we need to remember what supplementary means. Supplementary means adds to 180. They add to 180 degrees consecutive angles. So let's look at angle B, and we're talking about the angles right next to angle B. So we're talking about A, and we're talking about C. What this means is that the measurement of angle B plus the measurement of angle A is equal to 180 degrees. Similarly, we can say the measurement of angle B plus the measurement of angle C is equal to 180 degrees which we should have known because our previous theorem said that A and C are congruent because they are opposite. And then we can also say the same thing about if we talk about A, it's going to be supplementary to D and B, uh, etc. Going all the way around the parallelogram. Our last theorem we're going to talk about today says that a parallelogram has diagonals that bisect each other. So we need to draw in a diagonal that's from one vertex to another. Let's go B to D, uh, B to D, and also from A to C. Now, let's call that intersection point, let's call that, I don't know, M. What this theorem tells us here 
is that BM, segment BM, is congruent to segment DM. The reason why is that we have a diagonal and it's bisected, it's cut in half. Also, we know that AM mm -hmm. is congruent to CM. And again, because that diagonal is cut in half. So these are all the theorems we're going to talk about dealing with the properties of parallelograms. Now we're going to look at three examples, um, two or three examples, using these properties. Our first example says that EFGH is a parallelogram. And we have two parts here. We want to find the length of JG and the length of FH. So let's go ahead and start with part A. And we want to find the length of JG. Hmm. So we start this off, we say that JG, currently JG, we just know it's equal to W plus 8. Of course that's not a good enough answer for us, we have to find a number answer. Uh, might be helpful to find out what W is. Well how could we do that? Notice, EG is a diagonal. So is FH. In fact, this diagram looks very similar to our uh, last theorem. What we can say through that theorem is that EJ is congruent to JG. Meaning we now have 3W is equal to W plus 8. And now solving for W, uh, we can subtract the W over to see we have 2W is equal to 8. We can divide by 2. And thus we see that W is equal to 4. Now we're not quite done because we want to find JG. Well, we know what W is, so we can just substitute in here. JG is equal to 4 plus 8, or in other words, it is simply 12. And now we are done with part A. And now that we have done part A, we want to do part B. So for part B, we are supposed to find the length of FH. Now we're kind of doing the same thing here. Uh, we notice that FH is a diagonal uh, and EG is a diagonal. So this theorem, this previous theorem, tells us that FJ is congruent to JH. Now since these are congruent, we can say that 4Z minus 9 is equal to 2Z. And now we can solve for Z. We can uh, subtract 4Z over Subtract 4z, negative 9 is equal to negative 2z, and we divide by negative 2. This tells us that z is equal to 9 halves, or 9 over 2, which is also 4.5. Now again, we're not done yet because we need to start plugging in some z. First, we need to plug it in up here. We need to find what fj is equal to. fj is equal to 4 times 9 over 2 minus 9. And now simplifying this we get uh, 18, we get 9. Uh, you can type that into a calculator or you can go step by step. FJ is going to be equal to 9. So we saw this top segment was 9. Now we need to find JH. We can do this one of two ways. The first of way is just plug in 2 times 9 over 2 which gives us 9. And now we're done. Uh, the second way we could have found the length of JH is by using the fact that FJ is congruent to JH. So once you found FJ, you automatically know JH, which as we see, they both are 9. Now finding FH is fairly trivial because FH is simply 9 plus 9 or 18. This is using purely our last theorem. Uh, it wasn't too difficult, but you had to notice that these uh, segments were congruent. Our next example says that PQRS is a parallelogram. Three vertices are P, which is at negative 3, negative 2, Q, which is at negative 1, 4, and S, which is at 5, comma 0. We want to find the coordinates of vertex R. So my first guess would be is that we must graph this in the coordinate plane. So we go along here and we see that P, which is at negative 3, negative 2, which gives us P right here. Uh, Q, which is at negative 1, 4, so we put our Q up here. And S, which is at 5, comma 0. 
from the first slide, I told you that we name a parallelogram in the order the letters show up. So it goes P, then Q, then R, then S. What this means is that if we start at P, go up to Q, R has to be somewhere in this upper right vicinity. And that's because it would go P, Q, R, down to S. So we're looking somewhere in here, but where exactly? Well, notice the word parallelogram. Again, from the first slide, what does a parallelogram mean? A parallelogram is a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. Also probably why it's called a parallelogram. So parallel sides. We're also dealing with the coordinate plane. Whenever in your entire life you, uh, you are dealing with parallel and the coordinate plane, you should think about one phrase all the time, and this is same slope. Parallel implies same slope. So how we go about doing this now, because we're dealing with slope, what is slope? Slope is rise over run. So let's go ahead and see what the rise and the run is from things that we know. We know P, we know Q. So we can simply just go ahead and count. You could use the slope formula. You could say the, the y1 minus y2 over x sub 1 over uh, minus x sub 2. But since we have it in the plane, just go ahead and count. We go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the rise is going to be 6. What is the run? Well, we went up 6, so we went up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we went over 1, 2. So it's going to be 6 over 2, which is, uh, well, it's the same as 3 over 1. But because we're dealing with 6 over 2, let's deal with the, start at the S. We know it's going to be up in this vicinity, so that's going to help us out. But we're going to go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then over 2, which gives us our, our value right here. All we have to do is see what, that, uh, what the coordinates actually are there. Well, since it's over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's over 7 and up 6. R is at the coordinate 7, 6. And now we are all finished.